So hi everyone, welcome to the Everything Goes podcast. I'm Omar, your host. I know we have a lot of uh, new viewers here. Um, so, so thank you for joining the channel and joining the podcast. I hope you like it. If you do, subscribe. If you don't, that's also fine. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> now, I, because this is the first time for a lot of people, I'll do a little bit of intro. Um, basically, this podcast, this channel, is just to showcase how amazing and diverse ARMY are because any idiot can open a YouTube channel. And just because I decided to do it doesn't make my thoughts, my ideas, what I have to say any more important than, than anyone else. Um, so this whole channel is just to, for ARMY to geek out out loud and not just by text about anything BTS related, whether it's stuff that makes us angry or stuff that makes us happy. Um, this is what this channel is about. So anyone can be a guest here. Feel free to DM me. Doesn't matter how many followers you got. Um, and that's basically it. Now, these past few days, uh, some of you have seen this podcast when it, came, when it comes out, you might have seen that we're kind of doing a project here where should we ever be able to get this uh, channel monetized, uh, the money from this channel will go directly to fund army comeback goals. Um, so whether it's for funds for Bangtan or Borahe Bangtan or uh, Borahe funds, sorry, all those money will go there. Uh, so this is, by watching the videos here, it's another way to support uh, the BTS comeback. Um, but putting all that aside, let's get started. We have an amazing guest here um, that I know everyone's really excited to talk to. Uh, so we have uh, Brian Rowley here. Hi, Brian. <laughs> Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so, I'm so excited for this. <laughs> I apologize in advance if I have a, you know shifty eyes during this. I'm never really sure where to look during uh, Zoom interviews. So I don't know if I should look at the camera, if I should look at you, or somewhere else. So. Bear with me, everyone. Uh, thank you. We'll get through this together. <laughs> I, do, I do the same, like, because the camera is above my computer screen and also mm -hmm. questions here on the side. So it's like a whole mess. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be funny. Yeah, so today's been, like, when you listen to BTS songs, do you, like, go and read their lyrics and get into it or do you just enjoy the music? I'm starting to uh, dive into the, the translations a little bit more. Um, I'll admit I'm pretty uh, green with, with the whole situation. I'm pretty new to that. Um, I, I probably couldn't cite a bunch offhand, uh, but any anytime uh, a couple of people that I interact with pretty regularly on Twitter have pointed me in the direction of certain songs that they really love with their lyrics. Um, and every time I check it out, it's like, wow, this is, uh, there, there's always like a, a, a little, one line or like a turn of phrase or something that like makes me stop and I have to reread it a couple of times. Like, gosh, that's, that's really like, there's, there's a lot of depth behind that. There's more than meets the eye. Yeah. The, their songs are really, it takes time for it completely to sink in. Even if you read the lyrics, there's always, uh, there's a, an army called uh, Dulcet that does like translation and they also add like the Korean um, connotation and context. So you can like get a fuller picture of it. Mm -hmm. And that's really helpful to to fully understand. And then you have like all that psychology element and the storyline and the BTS has two has two different storylines in their uh, music. There's the video storyline and their album storyline, and it's so much stuff uh, that it really can be overwhelming at first. So take your time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I like about that is that, you know, this is music that can appeal to people on so many different levels. There's kind of the, the surface level of like, wow, this sounds good. It sounds catchy. Or like these videos are aesthetically pleasing. The choreography is amazing. The art and the color palettes, everything is just really striking. But then if you really want to dig into it and discover more of the themes in their lyrics and their videos, um, kind of immerse yourself in this whole universe that they're creating, um, you know, their art rewards closer listening and closer viewing as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, did you ever get a chance to check out their solo work? Yeah, um, particularly um, Mono by RM and uh, Suga's new mixtape uh, mix D2. Um, that's probably my favorite solo work uh, that I've heard so far. Yeah, and I, I, I love everything, it doesn't matter. Um, but, this podcast is named Everything Goes After Everything Goes from uh, Mono. So it's my favorite song in general. 
Mm-hmm. My alarm clock. That's how I wake up. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It's it's crazy. Uh, it, it's just amazing how prolific uh, the members of this group are um, to find time to put out different solo projects while also dropping like multiple albums in the same year. Um, you do not see many artists doing that these days. And they're also like, they, they really each have their own voice and they're all so different from one another. You can't say the D2 is anything like Mono or Hope World. Like it's, mm-hmm. just, it's a completely different story or that, uh, I don't know if you got a chance to hear the vocal line stuff, but that promise, uh, Jimmy's promise, and Tay's Winter Bear and Jim's Tonight, they're all so, so, and John Cook's, I won't forget one, and John Cook's still really, like, they're all so different from one another. It's incredible that they managed to, to, to work together as a team, like, mm-hmm. because, because you, we've all seen groups break up over creative differences. <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I think it's, you know, I, I love groups um, who are able to take such unique, uh, different elements and somehow fuse them together uh, in a way that, you know, it's just, it's just the alchemy of, of making music. That's what makes it so special. Um, I mean, you know, I, my, my favorite band of all time, I think some of the most talented musicians to ever live, uh, it's the Beatles. And there's no greater example, particularly with John and Paul. Uh, the music that they made after the Beatles split was so radically different. Um, and so much of it was great, but you were really able to take that, like that honey and vinegar, like these two totally different elements and bring them together for something that was just unreal. It was groundbreaking. Um, and you know, in a way, I think, uh, the members of BTS are accomplishing something similar, the way that they're not afraid to try on different genres and to evolve their sound on subsequent albums. Uh, there's really... Obviously, it's still rooted in pop and hip hop, but there's a, a fearlessness there. Um, like nothing is really off limits, um, and uh, I think that's great. Yeah, I agree. like their music. Like you said, it's more rooted in pop and hip hop, but they venture to so many different things. And lyrics-wise, I always like for me it goes more to the rock sort of uh, place that the lyrics tend to have a bit more depth into them that you have to dig in. Um, mm-hmm. Whether it's uh, The Who or um, Pink Floyd or whatever, like all these bands that um, the lyrics you read and the lyrics that and what they actually mean are a bit on the different side. And the music also not, doesn't necessarily accompany the lyrics because sometimes you just hear this really upbeat, fun song and it's actually not that <laughs> upbeat at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's great. Um, I mean, the, the first time when it came to just kind of like the depth of, of the lyrics and BTS songs, uh, I think the first time I really started to pay attention to that was when Black Swan came out and um, people were talking about the, the, the themes and the motivation behind the song. Just this idea that like, you know, this anxiety about when, if or when you could lose your passion for the thing that you love and that has become like the biggest part of your life um, and you know, that, that, that losing that passion is kind of like a fate worse than death. That's, um, that's a heavy theme. That's not something that's not ground that most mainstream pop songs uh, are going to, uh, cover. Um, and it's just, uh, yeah, I guess it's a testament to their, their songwriting that they're able to work those themes into songs that are still so catchy, still so listenable. Yeah. And they're incredible. <laughs> um, I'm, I keep wondering like what this new album is going to be um, about because we know it's going to be a bit more, um, well, Behit said it's going to be more BT-esque <laughs> and we know, which no one I think really knows what that means. We just know that the members put more into it than they usually do, mm-hmm. um, which is always uh, incredible to know that they put so much of themselves into that music. and they usually always like do little teases and we use we recently have had the un general assembly speech that they gave mm-hmm. with the uh leave on uh message yeah and i i keep wondering whether it's going to play into the album that would be really cool um you know, obviously this time not being able to tour not being able to perform live or do a lot of things that they were so accustomed to. Clearly from that UN speech, you can tell that 
this has really had an impact on them. Um, and, you know, it would be cool to see them kind of grapple with the events from the last six months. And uh, I think they would do it in a really eloquent, fascinating way. So uh, yeah, certainly if, if, uh, if this is an album that's kind of inspired by some current events and their reactions to them, um, that's definitely going to be one that people will spend a lot of time decoding and, and yeah. digging into the lyrics. Ami's favorite pastime. <laughs> it's <Yeah. surprising. laughs> I'll have to get paid for that. That's a public service for, uh, for those of us who don't have time or, or, or don't know how to do it ourselves. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's such a shame that some people felt the need to uh, mock their um, inclusion in that UN General Assembly. Mm -hmm. um, we saw what I call the British blue check attack, <laughs> which I think is fitting considering the, how it happened. Um, but basically, it was, it was kind of strange the concentration of like, why are these why are these British writers and media folks so upset about this? Why 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 only them? <laughs> it was really weird, and then it got even weirder. Like it took turns that I didn't see coming. <laughs> um, but yeah, it just, it came out of nowhere. Like the, for those who don't know, the um, uh, senior editor of The Economist decided to write, please no, on the, on the, the Washington uh, Post uh, article that said that BTS are giving a message of hope in this troubling time. And ARMY said, what the hell? But do you have a problem with BTS or a message of hope? Like, which one is it? Because both of these options are not it. And she apologized, but after that apology, and that was just a fake apology. And he said, oh, it was just a joke, I didn't mean it. And then after that apology, all the other British blue check writers came out of the woodwork and said, oh, it's just the internet, it doesn't mean anything. Oh, <laughs> what do you want? It's just a little Korean uh, boy band with no real importance. Um, uh, and yeah, and then it got even weirder with someone saying you can't be racist against white people because of the Holocaust, which we're not going to go there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you wrote a very nice article about it. Uh, you want to talk about it a bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, all of, all of the, uh, the negative feedback that um, you saw Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that continued into the weekend regarding BTS and the UN speech. The sad, the sad truth is that none of this is new. Um, there's a years long history of writers, radio show hosts, other media people talking uh, dismissively about BTS, um, trying to write their success off as just, you know, the product of uh, hysterical teenage girls, um, or to, you know, I thought the most egregious comment was the one, uh, all this for a little Korean boy band that's fundamentally not important. Um, I mean, there's, there's numerous things. It's like every, every word of that tweet, it's like there's a different reason that that's problematic. But really, I would uh, encourage the, the writer of that tweet to stop and ask yourself, would you include, if, if this were about a band or a group of people of any other race, would you have felt as confident putting that race in the place of Korean? Um, and I suspect that the answer would be no, because I think that they would have known better. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the tendency to dismiss BTS um, as a cultural phenomenon and to write off their fan base as a bunch of, you know, uh, hysterical teenagers, teen girls specifically, yeah. there's, there's a number of different motivations behind it a bunch of different isms basically uh it's like take your pick is it racism is it sexism is it ageism toward young people uh or is it xenophobia or is it a combination of all of the above and you know i'll, I'll give the benefit of the doubt to certain people who were involved in this whole scuffle you know people make mistakes people are you know they can be careless with their words i've done it you've probably done it we've all done it um but it's when you're presented with evidence as to why exactly was this problematic? Why, why was this maybe the wrong take? Why were your words hurtful to a large group of people? The way that you react to those things and internalize them and learn from them, that really determines whether or not like, you've, you've grown or you've learned anything from this interaction. 
I think it's possible that some of the people who were involved in this whole, you know, in the, uh, what did you call them? The, the, the British <laughs> blue check brigade. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's possible that some of the people involved grew from that. I think it's very likely that some of them just dug their heels in and doubled down on their original takes. Um, and, you know, I could, I could see that in, in the people I follow who were encouraging other people to stop engaging with them because at a certain point it's like, you know, there's like maybe a 24 or 48 hour window during which any sort of like discourse or like beef on Twitter can be meaningful and produce any positive results. After that, it's just, this is, this becomes an attention thing. Like I'm, I just like to stoke the flames of controversy because it's fun or because it's a way to, to signal boost myself. Um, and, you know, some people just aren't going to learn from that. And that's sad, but it's, it's true. Yeah. We, we were actually the final pretty used to people like doing it on purpose. We had Mr. Beast do it recently, uh, this gamer Frosty or whatever do it recently. Keemstar does it all the time. H3H3 H3 from the podcast does it, did it. Like we we're used to people that do it just for the sake of doing it. Mm -hmm. And we usually, sometimes we're strong enough to ignore it. Sometimes there's like you said, like a 24 hour where people engage and then just stop. Um, so yeah, so usually, the, but this was, just came out of nowhere. Just completely took us by surprise and like these aren't the type of people that you would assume would start something like this mm -hmm. so we were really surprised by it you know I, th I think um I think one thing that is always worth asking in times like this like when when people have uh dismissive or you know offensive things to say about BTS or about their fandom about any um non-white artist really I, I think it's worth asking like what was your motivation behind making this joke or this snide comment like sure maybe you were joking about this but what were you hoping to accomplish what was your joke rooted in you know every every joke has some sort of point or, or message behind it so what was yours what were you trying to get across when you said this um and furthermore it, it, you know i saw multiple people and and I, I, I turn off a lot of my Twitter notifications and I try not to engage too much with stuff that doesn't involve me. Um, but I saw so many examples of people saying like, you know, these are the racist comments that I've had to endure my whole life. You know, I've had to deal with this. Here's why your joke wasn't funny. Uh, because here's, here's the uh, discrimination I have personally faced for years. Do you think that's funny? Um, and I just don't understand when you're listening to other people relay the, the prejudice that they have personally felt and experienced, how can you deny that? Or how can you say, I don't care. Uh, I'm going to stick to my guns. My point still stands. Uh, you know, I stand behind my joke or whatever else I said. That just doesn't make sense to me. Me too. Like, I feel like in 2020, a joke at someone else's expense can only be seen as a joke only if that person that you're joking about is okay with it. That's the only way. Like, Anything else, if that person isn't there to say it, it's not okay anymore. You can't say that. It's right. no longer a joke. It's just mean. <laughs> exactly. Um, Rolling Stones, for the third time in about a year, posted an article about uh, pay-to-play, what is known as payola um, mm -hmm. acts in um, Western radio, in the US radio. Mm -hmm. and do and that the fact that it still exists despite people denying it for a while now say no no it's gone it's not here anymore no one does people and uh, do you think that comes into play where bts uh stands as far as radio um geez you know i i um i wouldn't want to speculate too much on that um i mean i would say it's not so much like if, if there were any sort of foul play going on there I don't think it would be so much like somebody was intentionally shutting out BTS because, um, you know, they didn't want to play it or something like that. Um, but just so that, just that they were pressured so much to play so many other things that it was like those other things took up all the rotation and suddenly there was no room left to play other artists. Um, I think so even if it's like, you know, these programmers aren't acting maliciously toward BTS, it's like, yeah. well, you know, this other, you know, XYZ at this record label 
wanted this many spins of Ed Sheeran or Khalid or Panic at the Disco or 21 Pilots. And so all of a sudden, like, we're all full, nothing we can do about it. Yeah, all the slots are full. No more free spins. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how much you noticed this when Map of the Soul 7 came out, but when On was released, it got zero radio play that first week. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was all under, like, all the DJs said that it was Colum uh, Columbia and Big Hits Fault because they didn't know it was the single. Like, there was no push for it. That was the word every single DJ used. There was no push for the song, and they didn't know On was the lead single. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, when the album came out, we expected to get at least the same radio play as Boy With Love, right? Because it's the following song. Usually you see, like, an incline in... Uh, radio play, so we expected that. And when it was obvious we weren't getting any radio play, the fandom decided to just, okay, if we're not getting those spins, we're gonna buy, because that's the most effective way to get the number, the high, like get a higher charting number. So everyone just really put that uh, effort into buying, and in addition to the normal streaming. And I think with this, with Dynamite, we, like, it's almost like we already had that system in place. We were very wary of radio, whether we we're actually going to get that, those spins or not. Because mm -hmm. radio always said that English was the reason why uh, they weren't playing BTS. But it always felt like an excuse to, because music is music. And it felt like you're not even giving people a chance to listen to it. Mm -hmm. So, and they were always, it would always say like, what goes in Texas doesn't go in New York, uh, what goes in New York doesn't go in Texas, which is like the most pretentious, pretentious thing to say ever. And especially BTS sold out a concert in New York and in Texas. So what the hell? <laughs> yeah. I mean, unless you're talking about like a regional station about like a more niche genre of music, like Red Dirt Country, sure, maybe that won't go over in New York, but we're talking about popular music. I don't think you would tell somebody that um, Harry Styles singles don't go over as well in New York as they do in Texas or Wyoming or Los Angeles. That just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I mean, uh, look, th this is nobody's first day on the internet. We all have streaming services. We have iTunes, we have Spotify. Uh, the idea of um, regional preferences isn't really an inhibiting factor anymore. Anybody anywhere can stream anything whenever they want. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it was just such ridiculous <laughs> arguments to make. Um, but I think like we were worried that it was gonna happen again, that we're gonna, so we just said, we're buying. Like we, radio player is bonus. We're buying this song. So we've been like, when On didn't get any radio play, uh, a DJ named Adam Baum mm -hmm. decided to reconnect with the fandom and and, and reach the gap between DJs and ARMY because ARMY were really upset, not just because ON didn't get any radio play, but because it was followed by this whole uh, radio outcry over Billboard, not exactly calculating um, five seconds of uh, summer, whatever the name, right? It's five seconds of summer, that's the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five seconds of summer, they're, they bundled with uh, concert tickets and Ticketmaster didn't give uh, Billboard numbers in time, so they didn't get the, uh, the albums for the tour added to their overall album. So they missed out on getting the number one uh, on Billboard 200. And they were very upset. The fans were very upset. And all the radio DJs uh, came together and said, this is wrong, Billboard, recalculate, what's going on? It's wrong. And we were like, where were you a month ago when we needed you? And, and then they started giving us like a whole bunch of excuses that were just wrong. Oh. But Adam decided to bridge a gap between uh, Army and, and the DJs and he sat with us and he talked with us and then said and decided to break down why BTS isn't played on radio and the thing he kept repeating one of the things he said that it was because it's not in English and he said it was because they were too big and then because they weren't big enough and because he actually said both of these like within seconds of each other and he said because what's played in New York doesn't play in Texas and um, and a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but one of the things he kept repeating was that there was no push for on to be played. And we kept asking him, what does it mean? What does, there's no push. And he didn't answer that. And mm -hmm. when you hear that payola is obviously still in play, you have to wonder if, that, if that's what it means. 
there's no push. Like, what else could it be? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is that is strange. Um, I don't really know what else that could mean. Um, I mean, again, radio of all of the kind of arenas of you know a song's performance, radio is the one I understand the least um, because I think it's a dying format that's uh, fading into irrelevance. But it still is important. Still has a big impact on a song's performance. So we got to pay attention to it. Um, but it's like, you know, big hit publicized the heck out of on. Um, they did the same full scale promo campaign that they do for all of BTS's comeback singles. They had at least one video. Did they have two videos for that song? They had a, a, the performance in uh, Jimmy Kimmel and Grand Central, uh, Jimmy Fallon in Grand Central Station. They had the Sia remix. Um, they had all these things. So I don't really understand where the lack of push comes from unless courting radio is an entirely independent process from promoting a song elsewhere. Um, and it's certainly, I don't think, I don't think that would be a case of negligence on Big Hit's part. They don't seem like the kind of company that would just not push a song to radio. Um, so yeah, I don't really understand what that was all about. I do vaguely remember that whole conversation. It was um, kind of convoluted, uh, kind of condescending to the fans as well. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, I wonder how much of it is the English. Like, BTS now have a new album coming out. The fandom is bigger than ever. But the question is, will we get, do you think we're going to get that radio play? Jeez. Well, I, I mean, I, we don't really have, we don't have any details about the, uh, the schedule yet for B, do we? No, we just know it's coming out on November 20th. And that's it. And so, you know, I think that in general, I think the um, staggered pre-release of singles is a good move. It builds it, it, it lets each song kind of have its time in the sun, whether it's for a few weeks or some of them stick around for a few months if they become uh, huge viral streaming hits um, and all those kind of snowball up to the release of the album. And so I think when it comes to courting radio um, and you know, kind of doing an album rollout in the, I, I guess, more traditional Western sense, um, I think that that has been a proven successful way. I think the, designating a song off the album as the lead single and then dropping it along with all the other multimedia the same day that the album comes out. Um, I do think for people who are just casual listeners or not really tuned in, that might be uh, confusing or hard to distinguish like, oh, which one am I like supposed to pay attention to the most, you know? Um, whereas with Dynamite, it was abundantly clear, like this is a standalone single and obviously all the promotional tools that we just talked about, like it made it very clear. This is the one you need to pay attention to right now. I think that Big Hit made an excellent move um, announcing that the album was going to come out so shortly after Dynamite came out um, because again, like BTS's name is on everybody's lips right now. Um, obviously the fandom has continued to grow, but people from all corners of the internet are, are talking about them now. And so I don't really know, honestly, I am not super plugged into, uh, you know, pop radio trends because I very rarely listen to terrestrial radio um, especially now, you know, since the pandemic, I don't really drive that often. So uh, I mostly just listen to Spotify when I'm at home. Um, but I think that, you know, Dynamite attracted a lot of new casual BTS fans who will definitely be tuning in at least to casually stream the album when it comes out. And I think that the response from the army when it comes to uh, their buying power, I, I think it's going to be uh, massive. Um, you know, I know, I don't want to. I don't want to make any outlandish predictions and and stress anybody out or or you know set a bar that you know if they don't meet it it would feel like a disappointment because I know the sales are going to be huge no matter what. Um, but if you just look at the difference in performance between On versus Dynamite over the course of what six or seven months, um, mm -hmm. if you use that same multiplier across all those different metrics for um, B versus Map of the Soul Seven, it's it's going to be gigantic. Yeah. It will definitely be huge. <laughs> um, the thing is, like, I don't know if you noticed, but iHeart uh, are they they're in debt, in pretty big debt, like billions of dollars of debt. And now, instead of like trying to close, it even the government even forgave them for some of it. They're like, oh no, you don't. You only have to return five billion dollars or something like that, six billion dollars, and. Um, now with COVID, like you said, less people are 
uh, driving, less people are listening to the radio. Anyways, less people are listening to the radio, right? We're all on Spotify or Apple Music. And mm -hmm. the thing is, with and, and so they have a lot of less ads as well. Like people invest less money in ads now because they know people aren't driving anymore. So you would think iHeart would love to pair with BTS and use that uh, fandom power and decide like maybe to do special BTS hours on their 850 stations or, and then they can like really push the ads or uh, do something to help to, to partner with BTS and ARMY and help themselves that way. Um, so do you think something like this can happen? Like, honestly, I don't, but. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know that it will, but it certainly should. I mean, I've, I've been saying this for a while, every Western media outlet across all formats, um, if they want to make some money, they need to start catering to BTS fans more. Um, I said this a couple months ago on Twitter and I stand by it. Uh, if Rolling Stone, which recently uh, moved to a subscription uh, based model on their, um, on their website, if, uh, if they wanted to make enough money to last through 2022, all they had to do was put BTS on the cover and uh, promote their you know, $5 a month subscription and they'd get tens or hundreds of thousands of new subscriptions just so people could read good content about this band. Um, Assuming it, that is good because we saw with the, the Hollywood Reporter that they were some, or with the Time Magazine recently that did that special issue mm -hmm. that said that Backstreet Boys paved the way for BTS. Um, right. Obviously, any uh, any media that it, it can't be um, it can't be lazy. It can't be um, pandering without doing your homework. Obviously, the unspoken other end of the bargain is that you know these radio programmers or reporters or whoever they're going to make good content that's actually worth investing in. Yeah, because I mean, we're smart. <laughs> right. Obviously, y'all have a great y'all y'all know how to filter out the stuff that that is not worth <laughs> your time. Um, but no, I think the you know the radio. Um, concepts or, or the radio dilemma yeah i don't i don't really know like how i, I don't have a great understanding of, of advertising with radio again like i said i'm not super plugged into it but it i don't really see any scenario in which it could hurt radio programmers to incorporate bts more give them more spins um create some sort of exclusive or unique content related to them um if there were any way that they could get them to do like a takeover or like host on a certain program for like an hour. You know, you see that stuff all the time on Sirius XM, especially like I was just listening the other day and I think it was like Lovely the Band came in and they were just playing some of their favorite songs from, you know, their youth for like the hour. You know, if you could get them to host um, a show for 30 minutes or an hour, it would be uh, a great way to get more people to tune in. Yeah, definitely. Very. Um, do you think that radio should still be a part of Billboard Hot 100? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess for, you know, as long as radio exists and continues to play music, it, it should have some sway on it. Um, I mean, personally, you know, and I forget, I don't, I don't know, I'm actually not sure which one factors in, um, you know, in order of radio sales and uh, streaming. I don't know sales. what the heck this is. What's that? Sales is the most, and I'm pretty sure, I think radio and streaming is pretty much equivalent. Okay. I mean, I think that radio is at this point far less um, indicative of how popular a song is in the country, um, especially because so much of it is subject to, I mean, if the report that Rolling Stone published this week is true and uh, programmers are accepting money uh, and other sorts of incentives to play music, I mean, it's, it's not an accurate uh, depiction of what people actually want to hear. Radio isn't dictated by what fans want. Uh, radio at this point is the same, like, half dozen artists whose singles keep getting played over and over and over again because radio programmers are saying like, oh, well, this will do well, or like, this is what people actually want to hear. Um, whereas streaming, you know, people are actively engaging with those songs or choosing to stream those songs. And the same thing with sales. It just, I think radio um, should still be there, but it should be, um, uh, it should be less prioritized than it is now. Yeah, well, we'll see. I, I'm, I'm not holding my breath for that to happen anytime soon. <laughs> I wouldn't either. Like, like we said last week, all of these institutions are so antiquated and um, they're not very transparent about how things go down. And, you know, anything that's run by a group of people is prone to corruption. And so um, yeah. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't get my hopes up that it'll change or get better. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's a pessimistic podcast tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, for anyone who's just, this is your first exposure to me. I'm, I, who am I kidding? I'm normally this pessimistic, but uh, that's whatever. That's, that's my brand, I guess. There's always, there's always a, a bow on it at the end. We find the silver lining eventually. Yeah, like that iconic line about the Grammys when they snubbed BTS last year. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you remember that. <laughs> Imprinted in my head. <laughs> yeah. For those who don't know, I'm not going to tell you. You should go check out the article. I saw, I saw some people back when I wrote that who followed me, and that was like their Twitter bio, which I thought was uh, hilarious. Very flattering, but very funny as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's move on to uh, <laughs> the future a bit and look into it at, to 2021. Hopefully, maybe we'll start getting some concerts. Um, but <laughs> so um, it's going to be so hard getting BTS tickets now. Um, oh yeah, they're going to be uh, they're going to be more valuable than gold, especially anybody that's holding on to tickets from the tour that just got postponed. Yeah, like the U.S. Army, let's get to buy this. Europe Army, Asian Army, we didn't get a chance to buy it yet. Only oh, US those, those are not on sale yet. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. But good luck. <laughs> it's going to be the Hunger Games. I was just going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but putting that aside, we get a concert soon. Well, it will, it will keep us for a bit, uh, for a little bit, um, we'll be okay. Um, but in 2021, we have the Grammy and now we have the, um, for your consideration part, I guess, of the Grammy where people make nominations. And uh, what, what do you think? Do you think the Grammy, like, because obviously you, we have the Grammy Museum, which does amazing stuff, and BTS were on it, and they were, this is their second time on it, on their interview there, and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And there's the Grammy social media account, which does, which really supports BTS. But obviously mm -hmm. none of that has anything to do with the Grammy itself, which we know is a problematic, old-fashioned, not the most open-minded um, organization out there. Right, they're all about quality over quantity, but very selective about their who they consider quality. Mm -hmm. um, do you expect BTS to get a nomination this year? Geez, honestly, this is a tough question. I've gone back and forth on this a lot. Um, I, I am not optimistic about the Recording Academy's ability to uh, step up and you know recognize BTS in, in the major categories that I think they deserve to be in. Um, I would say, I mean, and also this year is crowded with a bunch of pop out mainstream pop and rock albums that were objectively really good. Um, and a lot of them were put out by artists who are industry and Academy darlings. Um, and so I wouldn't be surprised if those artists take precedence over BTS in a lot of the big categories. Um, Dynamite was released within the consideration or the eligibility period for 2021. I think if anything, um, that song might have a better chance at getting nominated for some of the, the bigger, uh, you know, uh, song, individual song awards rather than Map of the Soul 7. Um, and if that does happen, it should surprise nobody that it's because it's a song performed entirely in English that was kind of engineered to uh, appeal to a larger Western audience. Um, it would be, it would be great. That would be a huge moment for them. The motivations behind it might be disappointing if you dug into that, but again, it would still be, I think, a huge victory and triumph just to be considered. Um, honestly, I've got to say the one thing that would uh, infuriate me more than being shut out of the Grammys entirely, which you know, BTS is used to at this point, uh, is if they somehow got nominated for Best New Artist, which I saw a couple places, a couple blogs and websites um, making those predictions, which again, you have to take all those predictions with a grain of salt. They're kind of meaningless. But um, just the fact that anyone thought that that might be in the realm of possibility, uh, oof, I will be so upset if that happens. That would be worse than getting no nominations at all. Yeah, it would be very, very frustrating, definitely. Um... Yeah. Do you think the Grammy even wants to like, sh or the Recording Academy even wants to shake that image that people have of them of a uh, problematic uh, organization? <laughs> you can, say old, you can say old white men. It's fine. No, no big deal. <laughs> it's yeah. It's like it's really old fashioned. It's really it's it's not just we've all read uh, Deborah. I think was what, what was her name? 
that she was the um, God, she was like the head of the something at the recording academy, and they fired her for sending an email wanting to fix all those problematic things that they right. did. Okay, yeah, like um, rigging who is nominated and uh, the misogyny and racism and and sexual. Um, 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 the word escapes me, but she <laughs> accused them of a lot of stuff in that yeah. uh, lawsuit, and mm-hmm. and I wonder if they even wanna if they even care to to try and like make amends because that was like right at the week when the Grammy was supposed to happen mm-hmm. um, last year. So last year they didn't have anything that they could do, um, mm-hmm. but this time they have like time to prepare and make. Do you think they would even care about it? That they would even want to change that perception that people have? Gosh, it's maybe they do, at, uh, you know, at least at face value, obviously, um, you know, being woke is a, uh, is a fashionable thing for institutions like that to do. Um, but so many of these institutions, especially the Grammys, they're just so archaic and their, uh, voting board is made up of, I mean, if it's the same people who are submitting their nominations every year and the, um, you know, sample size of people who are putting in those nominations is just so homogenous, then for the Grammys to make any sort of progress, it would happen at a glacial pace. Um, So maybe they do want to set the gears in motion to become, you know, a more reputable institution that's able to feature a more diverse array of artists. But if that is the case, uh, I wouldn't hold my breath for it happening this year. It might take, you know, five, 10, 15 years uh, if, if you want to it's like with any system. Um, We've seen it with the Oscar as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, I mean, in the same way that actual, you know, governmental politics changes glacial, same with entertainment industry politics. There's just, it's been broken for so long that it would be, it would take so, it would take a long time to even find the root of the problem, let alone put in the work to fix it. Um, I know that sounds pretty pessimistic. Uh, I do believe that it is possible, um, but I also, have never put a lot of faith in award shows to be, um, you know, a barometer for what's actually affecting culture at any given moment. Yeah. Uh, I think the thing is that this year it would especially hurt if they weren't nominated because lately they've been really open about they know that ARMY, for example, sent gifts to radio DJs in order to beg them to play BTS songs and got yelled at and cursed at for doing that. Like people sent legit cupcakes, flowers, gifts to radio DJs asking them to play BTS back in 2017, 2018. And they were yelled at, those cupcakes were thrown. People said, oh, they must be poison. Um, yeah, and like, you know, it's from a bakery. It's like, it, it wasn't even homemade. It was like from this fancy bakery, but. Um, and then we found out that the radio teachers had a group chat where they um, talked shit about BTS. Um, um, but we see BTS talk about it now. They mentioned that, they mentioned how alienated they feel by the Western music industry. And it's just, it, they're the biggest group right now in the world there's no one bigger than them. For them to feel alienated by the music industry, it's just, it's stunning, I think. Like they never said something like that before. And to hear them actually say it, uh, I think it left all of us a bit raw, I guess. I mean, you know, like you said, it it's one thing for fans to say that, you know, they have dealt with that sort of, discrimination or that they have felt alienated. Um, but for, like you said, the, some of the biggest artists in the world, some of the mo- seven of the most famous people on the planet right now to say that they still deal with that stuff. Um, that, that hurts. And I hope that it makes people stop and understand that this isn't just about, um, this isn't just jokes. This isn't just petty remarks. This is like real, uh, this is real prejudice and this is real, these are real people who are hurting um, from those behaviors. Um, and yeah, I, I do hope that, I do hope that people get the memo and 
that that changes. And, and that doesn't mean that they have to sweep every award show and they have to break every record and get invited to every you know radio and TV hosts program. Um, all it means is that they would like to be treated with uh, the same respect and legitimacy that all of their Western peers received. Yeah. They, the thing is they, yeah, they really, they usually hide that stuff from us. Like they don't really like to show when they're really hurt like that. And so for them to actually share it, that must have been so painful. We've seen them like last year, uh, they were invited to Variety's Hitmakers um, mm. event. And they were on one Variety's Hitmaker group of the year. And during that event, you know, they were all dressed up looking good and, and like fix and everything. And they were walking and this woman, while they were walking, this woman said, oh my God, they're wearing makeup or something like that. And she like practically shouted, like it was on camera and like people watching the video heard it. And BTS obviously heard it and they're not idiots. They know English just because they can speak it. It doesn't mean they don't understand it. It's two different things. And that day, like that video came out a while later, but that day, Jean posted a photo and said, it's just a shame to let that makeup go to waste, to, uh, to let this look go to waste uh, with all this makeup and posted a photo. And after that, like, I mean, you put the dots together, but, but um, they, they get hurt. They're people. And to see like people in the industry treat them that badly, that they feel alienated by it. To see them being invited to iHeart special events and then get zero, zero radio play for them um it's just it's 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 painful to watch because they do it and uh, yeah well yeah uh i mean especially in regards to award shows it's frustrating to see them get shut out from award shows but then invited uh to perform or to present an award or even just to be members in the audience prominently featured just because uh, you know people want to use bts for clout but then when it comes time to actually give them their due as legitimate artists people don't suddenly that's an issue. Um, it's like people think that they can milk or piggyback off of their success and pander to their fans. But if you're going to do that, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to talk the talk, then you have to walk the walk too. And you have to actually give credit where it's due. Yeah. Yeah. But they just want all the views from the teenage girls to watch. Yeah. Yeah. The you know, DJ say that um, you're not a real fan of BTS unless you watch everything they do. Um, when he invited them to the show and treated them like crap. He said, we have to watch it because only real fans would watch everything. If you don't watch everything, you're not a real fan. Um, yeah. So that's the, the kind of people we deal with <laughs> here in this. I mean, if, that's, if that's the criteria, then I'm going to have to give back my, my fan card. I haven't even, I haven't watched and heard everything yet. <laughs> you know, the, the one thing I, I would say that is um, encouraging is I've been vocal about this before. BTS have repeatedly had to work twice as hard as their Western peers to be taken half as seriously. Um, the fact that they have been able to rise above that adversity and continue to make history is a testament to their popularity uh, and, and to, to you and to me, to the fans. Um, the, the one thing that I think is the silver lining here is that at the end of the day, a number one single or a number one album or awards, nominations and victories those things are just arbitrary measures of, of success, of popularity and critical esteem. They don't have any intrinsic value. They're, they're symbols for uh, people look at a billboard number one hit and they say, oh great, this artist must be really popular. Um, and I think that the BTS army is kind of redefining uh, or rewriting the way people evaluate all these things. Um, you know, people, have a problem when they chart a new number one single or a number one album, or I'm, I'm sure if they get nominated for Grammys this year, some people will complain and, and argue that they don't deserve it uh, because they'll probably accuse army of like bribing the Academy or something, you know, who knows it wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past anybody. But if, 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 a, if an artist has a fandom that is that dedicated and that willing to go the extra mile to make sure that their favorite artist gets recognized and treated with respect, isn't that literally the whole point of a fan base? Uh, isn't that like the very definition of success and popularity to have an enormous amount of fans who will ride for you, who will advocate for you, who will you know jump through these hoops with you so that you can basically Trojan horse your way into an industry that has been very slow to accept you and take you seriously? I mean, I really think that 
when it comes to the the size and the passion of, of the BTS army, people like they are they are changing the rules for how artists are are perceived, uh, especially in the United States. Um, and obviously, you know, people. It, it sucks to have to deal with that sort of adversity and that mistreatment. I know in a perfect world, they would just be regarded in the same way as, as any other pop stars. Um, but I think we can all take heart in the fact that, you know, they have so many fans that are willing to go the extra mile for them. Yeah. It's so funny that they choose to dismiss like the fandom because it's so big and strong and stuff because like, it's not as if it's easy to get, like these people have to be so unique and put so much back into the fandom f to get a fandom that dedicated it doesn't come easy no one else has one mm -hmm. um it's it's so it's so funny to dismiss it as if it's like this common thing that oh of course it, it's always there like no one else has a fandom like that and so these people must be doing something different or have something special going for them to allow for such a fandom to happen because and also like this fandom is super diverse so and that's one of the reasons why we're able to do the things that we do, because people not only come from different backgrounds and races, and, but they also come from different ages. And that with different ages come different um, financial aspects. Like mm -hmm. the fandom has as a fandom uh, more money because we have older fans here. Like teenagers can't buy cars that cost a whole lot of money like they can't buy a new phone every other day right they can't they can't buy uh albums and donate money for charity and they can't donate for one million dollars for black lives matter like mm -hmm. to have a fandom that can do all that you have to be someone very special to ignite such passion in such a diverse group of people mm -hmm. um yeah you, you said it. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, thank you. Well, thanks so much. I'm glad we got to do a, a follow-up to this. Too. I really, I really do. The people watching will know the difference because I was able to keep my glasses on this time. So. Yeah. I tried <laughs> the continuity, oh, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I, I, ended, I wore the same shirt, but then I was like, well, I'd rather see the screen. You were kind of just like a, a fuzzy shape of a person last time. That's okay. Uh, excellent. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you, Brian. This was awesome. And I'm positive we're going to do this again. Uh, because this was just so much fun. I certainly hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Next article. <laughs> hey, I mean, that's the thing about BTS. They just keep giving us uh, more and more and more. Um, it's like, you know, we're, it's like I'm a rabbit and they just keep putting carrots down in front of us. Uh, so uh, we've got B coming out soon, and then I'm sure there will be the Think Piece machine is going to fire up all over again. So I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> There'll definitely be records to write about. Oh, yeah, I can't wait. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, thank you. And thank you everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And send Purple Hearts, Brian's Way. And uh, bye. Thanks for having me. See ya. Okay. And we're done. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry.